Greetings and salutations. We're about to start Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. So it's a well-worn copy. We'll um, be reading through it, and if you're one of my students, then you know what you need to do as far as the assignments. Um, for some of them, you'll be doing a 54321, and that would be for the odd chapters. And for the even chapters, you'll be doing mind maps, Google Slides. So I'll show you an example of one. Anyhow, we'll, uh, we'll get started here, and the story starts off with these letters. Every now and then, be ready to write in your notes uh, things I'm going to ask you as far as jotting down, I'll interrupt, and anything I put on the blackboard, with, well, actually the whiteboard, which is hidden behind us. So, uh, here we go, and um, we'll take it from here, so just pay attention. Sometimes I'll ask you to put comments in the YouTube uh, section 2. And I'll refer to Google as the Google, and I'll call YouTube probably the YouTubes. Anyhow, um, we'll switch it up with a little bit of each chapter, and this will be the letters, and then we'll get through the other chapters. So here we go with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Letter 1. <clears throat> Please follow along. Uh, you might have an electronic version, or you might have a hard copy. But here we go. To Mrs. Seville, England, St. Petersburg, December 11th, 17 blank. That's because Mary Shelley was leaving it up to the reader to decide when. This was a story that took place in the past. The story was published in uh, around 1820, so this is supposed to be something that happened, but we're not certain exactly when. So kind of a based on a true story. Uh, this is from a guy you'll find out that's writing to his sister. You'll rejoice to hear that no disaster has accompanied the commencement of an enterprise which you've regarded with such evil forebodings. I arrived here yesterday, and my first task is to assure my dear sister of my welfare and increasing confidence in the success of my undertaking. We're wondering what it is. He shall tell us. I'm already far north of London. St. Petersburg being in Russia at that time. And as I walk in the streets of St. Petersburg, I feel a cold northern breeze play upon my cheeks, which braces my nerves and fills me with delight. Do you understand this feeling? This breeze, which has traveled from the regions toward which I am advancing, gives me a foretaste of those icy climes. Inspirited by this wind of promise, my daydreams become more fervent and vivid. I try in vain to be persuaded that the pole is the seat of frost and desolation. It ever presents itself to my imagination as the region of beauty and delight. There, Margaret, the sun is forever visible, its broad disk just skirting the horizon and diffusing a perpetual splendor. There, for with your leave, my sister, I will put some trust in preceding navigators. There, snow and frost are banished. And sailing over a calm sea, we may be wafted to a land surpassing in wonders and in beauty every region hitherto discovered in the habitable globe. Its productions and features may be without example, as the phenomena of the heavenly bodies undoubtedly are in those undiscovered solitudes. Right? I mean, they believe that at some point you would go through the land of snow and ice, and then on the other side... As he said, it's a beautiful, wonderful place. What may not be expected in a country of eternal light. So they got that idea. Perpetual light. You know, it's at the pole. Uh, but it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. I may there discover the wondrous power which attracts the needle and may regulate a thousand celestial observations that require only this voyage to render their seeming eccentricities consistent forever. I shall satiate my ardent curiosity with the sight of a part of the world never before visited and may never tread a land never before imprinted by the foot of man. Little trivia, it wasn't until the 20th century that humans had made it to the North Pole. And this is written in the 19th century. So, yeah, nobody had ever been there. These are my enticements. And they, may, they are sufficient to conquer all fear of danger or death and to induce me to commence this laborious voyage with the joy a child feels when he embarks in a little boat with his holiday mates on an expedition of discovery up his native river. 
But supposing all these conjectures to be false, you cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind to the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries to reach which at present so many months are requisite or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be effected by an undertaking such as mine. So see, he's off to be the first, and even if it's not true what he thinks is there, he shall, as an explorer, benefit mankind. He's doing it for the good of other people, to satiate curiosity, not just his own reflections on perhaps fame. These reflections have dispelled the agitation with which I began my letter. I feel my heart glow with an enthusiasm which elevates me to heaven, for nothing contributes so much to tranquil the mind as a steady purpose. That's a good line, huh? Take a look at that. You might underline it. You might write that down. Nothing contributes so much to tranquilize the mind as a steady purpose, a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual eye. We need to purpose. This expedition has been the favorite dream of my early years. I have read with ardor the accounts of the various voyages which have been made in the prospect of arriving at the North Pacific Ocean through the seas which surround the pole. You may remember that a history of all the voyages made for purposes of discovery composed the whole of our good uncle Thomas's library. My education was neglected. Yet I was passionately fond of reading. These volumes were my study day and night, and my familiarity with them increased that regret which I had felt as a child on learning that my father's dying injunction had forbidden my uncle to allow me to embark in a seafaring life. So he and his sister were orphans, lived with the uncle, and he's going against what... It, why is it that his father didn't want him to have a, sea, a seafaring life? He, in a way, is a rebel. Um, some of this reflects Mary Shelley and the Times. we can talk about that later. These visions faded when I perused for the first time the poets whose effusions entranced my soul and lifted it to heaven. I also became a poet and for one year lived in a paradise of my own creation. I imagined that I also might obtain a niche in the temple where the names of Homer and Shakespeare are consecrated. You are well acquainted with my failure and how heavily I bore the disappointment. But just at that time, I inherited the fortune of my cousin, and my thoughts were turned into the channel of their earlier bent. Six years have passed since I resolved on my present undertaking. I can't even now remember the hour which I dedicated myself to this great enterprise. I commenced by inuring my body to hardship, I accompanied the whale fishers on several expeditions to the North Sea. I voluntarily endured cold, famine, thirst, and want of sleep. I often worked harder than the common sailors during the day and devoted my nights to the study of mathematics, the theory of medicine, and those branches of physical science from which a, na a naval adventurer might derive the greatest practical advantage. Twice I actually hired myself as an undermate in a Greenland whaler, and acquitted myself to admiration. I must own I felt a little proud when my captain offered me the second dignity in the vessel and entreated me to remain with the greatest earnestness. So valuable did he consider my services. So what we're finding out about this guy Walton is a little bit of his ethos, his experience, his dream, but it's not a foolish dream. He's actually studied it, and now he's on his way to make history. And now, dear Margaret... Do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? It's a key line. What's his motive? I want you to write that down. Huh? Do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? My life might have been passed in ease and luxury, but I preferred glory to every enticement that wealth placed in my path. Huh? Why is he doing it? He doesn't have to do this. He has a life of wealth. He doesn't have to work. But what's his motivation? Glory. Glory more than anything. Fame. He's out there to do it. So he might become famous. Uh, he tried that earlier. He wanted to be a famous poet. Failed. Uh, now he wants to be a famous adventurer. Oh, that some encouraging voice would answer in the affirmative. My courage and my resolution is firm, but my hopes fluctuate. 
and my spirits are often depressed. I'm about to proceed on a long and difficult voyage, the emergencies of which will demand all my fortitude. I am required not only to raise the spirits of others, but sometimes to sustain my own when theirs are failing. This is the most favorable period for traveling in Russia. They fly quickly over the snow in their sledges. The motion is pleasant, and in my opinion, far more agreeable than that of an English stagecoach. The cold is not excessive, if you are wrapped in furs, a dress which I have already adopted, for there is a great difference between walking the deck and remaining seated motionless for hours, when no exercise prevents the blood from actually freezing in your veins. I have no ambition to lose my life on the post road between St. Petersburg and Archangel. I shall depart for the latter town in a fortnight, fortnight being two weeks, not the game, or uh, three weeks, and my intention is to hire a ship there, which can easily be done by paying the insurance for the owner and to engage as many sailors as I think necessary among those who are accustomed to the whale fishing. I do not intend to sail until the month of June, and when shall I return? Ah, dear sister, how can I answer this question? If I succeed, many, many months, perhaps years, will pass before you and I may meet. If I fail, you'll never see me again, soon or never. Farewell, my dear, excellent Margaret. Heaven shower down blessings on you, and save me, that I may again and again testify my gratitude for all your love and kindness. Your affectionate brother, R. Walton. So there's the first letter she gets. This is a frame story. By the way, these letters she gets are later, um, and she's sharing them with us. So again, you look at the date. So we know that this is, we don't know if he survives or not. We just know that she got these letters and decided to share them with us and let us know about his adventure. Um, it is kind of neat, the idea that he has money and decides to do something with it rather than just spend it all on himself. He's got the money to invest in adventure. <clears throat> Letter 2. To Mrs. Seville, England, Archangel, 28th March, 17 blank. How slowly the time passes here, encompassed as I am by frost and snow. Yet a second step has taken towards my enterprise. I have hired a vessel and am occupied in collecting my sailors. Those whom I have already engaged appear to be men on whom I can depend and are certainly possessed of dauntless courage. But I have one want which I have never yet been able to satisfy, and the absence of the object of which I now feel is a most severe evil. I have no friend. Key point, I want you to jot that down. Put that in your notes. That's your number two for today's reading. This guy Walton has no friend. He wants a friend. This is a theme we're going to see. Margaret, when I am glowing with the enthusiasm of success, there may be none to participate my joy. If I am assailed by disappointment, no one will endeavor to sustain me in dejection. I shall commit my thoughts to paper, it is true, but that is a poor medium for the communication of feeling. I desire the company of a man who could sympathize with me, whose eyes would reply to mine. You may deem me romantic, my dear sister, but I bitterly feel the want of a friend. There it is, the second time. So part of his motivation is this fame to figure out what's going on, uh, how to get to the North Pole. But the other part is not to do it alone, the need for a companion. I have no one near me, gentle yet courageous, possessed of a cultivated as well as a capacious mind, whose tastes are like my own, to approve or amend my plans. How would such a friend repair the faults of your poor brother? I am too ardent in execution and too impatient of difficulties, but it is a still greater evil to me that I am self-educated. For the first 14 years of my life, I ran wild on a common and read nothing but our Uncle Thomas's books of voyages. At that age, I became acquainted with the celebrated poets of our own country, but it was only when I had ceased to be in my power to derive its most important benefits from such a conviction that I perceive the necessity of becoming acquainted with more languages than that of my native country. Now I am 28, and am in reality more illiterate than many schoolboys of 15. It is true that I have thought more, and that my 
daydreams are more extended and magnificent, but they want, as the painters call it, keeping. I greatly need a friend, third time, who would have a sense enough not to despise me as romantic and affection enough for me to endeavor to regulate my mind. Um, so this is the backstory. Who is this character? And Mary Shelley's revealing a lot about him. Again, she reemphasizes that he's an orphan. She shows us that he's self-educated. Um, and that his age is 28. That's important. When we watch a lot of the videos, or if you see a lot of the movies, Walton is usually shown as an older man, not this young man. Um, so, 28 years old. Well, these are useless complaints. I shall certainly find no friend on the wide ocean, not even here an archangel among merchants and seamen. Yet some feelings, unallied to the dross of human nature, beat even in these rugged bosoms. My lieutenant, for instance, is a man of wonderful courage and enterprise. He is madly desirous of glory, or rather to word my phrase more characteristically, of advancement in his profession. He's an Englishman, and in the midst of national and professional prejudices, unsoftened by, cult uh, by cultivation, retains some of the noblest endowments of humanity. I first became acquainted with him on board a whale vessel, finding that he was unemployed in this city. I easily engaged him to assist in my enterprise. The master is a person of excellent disposition and is remarkable in the ship for his gentleness and the mildness of his discipline. This circumstance, added to his well-known integrity and dauntless courage, made me very desirous to engage him. A youth passed in solitude, my best years spent under your gentle and feminine fosterage, has so refined the groundwork of my character that I cannot overcome an intense distaste to the usual brutality exercised on board ship. I have never believed it to be necessary. And when I heard of a mariner equally noted for his kindliness of heart and the respect and obedience paid to him by his crew, I felt myself particularly fortunate in being able to secure his services. I heard of him first in rather a romantic manner, from a lady who owes to him the happiness of her life. This briefly is his story. Some years ago he loved a young Russian lady of moderate fortune, and having amassed a considerable sum in prize money, the father of the girl consented to the match. He saw his mistress once before the destined ceremony, but she was bathed in tears, and throwing herself at his feet entreated him to spare her, confessing at the same time that she loved another but that he was poor, and that her father would never consent to the union. My generous friend reassured the suppliant, and, on being informed of the name of her lover, instantly abandoned his pursuit. He had already bought a farm with his money, on which he had designed to pass the remainder of his life, but he bestowed the whole on his rival, together with the remains of his prize money to purchase stock, and then himself solicited the young woman's father to consent to her marriage with her lover. But the old man decidedly refused, thinking himself bound in honor to my friend, who, when he found the father inexorable, quitted his country, not returned until he heard that his former mistress was married according to her inclinations. What a noble fellow, you will exclaim. He is so, but then he is wholly uneducated. He is as silent as a Turk, and a kind of ignorant carelessness attends him, which, while it renders his conduct the more astonishing, detracts from the interest and sympathy which otherwise he would command. It's a neat little story. Um, the story itself is a story, frame story. So there's stories within stories. We get the first one here. That idea of love, the guy loved this woman so much that his ultimate happiness was based on her happiness. And he gives up his pursuit for her, everything, so that she might be happy. By the way, now, what does he have to live for? It's not there, so he's joined Walton on this adventure. Now, it would sound like, wow, that's a great partner for Walton. What a great friend. Except uh, the guy's not as educated as you think. So, nice guy, but not quite the friend he's looking for. Yet do not suppose, because I complain a little, or because I can conceive a consolation for my toils, which I may never know, that I am wavering in my resolutions. Those are as fixed as fate, and my voyage is only now de delayed until the weather shall permit my embarkation. The winter has been dreadfully severe, but the spring promises well, 
and it is considered as a remarkably early season, so that perhaps I may sail sooner than I expected. I shall do nothing rashly. You know me sufficiently to confide in my prudence and considerateness whenever the safety of others is committed to my care. I cannot describe to you my sensations on the near prospect of my undertaking. It is impossible to communicate to you a conception of the trembling sensation, half pleasurable and half fearful, with which I am preparing to depart. I am going to unexplored regions, to the land of mist and snow. That's in quotes, by the way, because it's a reference um, to the rhyme of the ancient mariner. But I shall kill no albatross. Therefore, do not be alarmed for my safety, or if I should come back to you as worn and woeful as the ancient mariner. You will smile at my illusion, but I will disclose a secret. I have often attributed my attachment to, my passionate enthusiasm for, the dangerous mysteries of ocean to that production of the most imaginative of modern poets. This next line, underline, write down. I expect you to write this number three. This should be in your notes for today, for the letters, number three. There is something at work in my soul which I do not understand. You need to explore that. I am practically industrious, painstaking, a workman to execute with perseverance and labor. But besides this, there is a love for the marvelous, a belief in the marvelous, intertwined in all my projects, which hurries me out of the common pathways of men, even to the wild sea and unvisited regions I am about to explore. But to return to dear considerations, shall I meet you again? After having traversed immense seas and returned by the most southern cape of Africa or America, I dare not expect such success, yet I cannot bear to look on the reverse of the picture. Continue for the present to write me by every opportunity. I may receive your letters on some occasions when I need them most to support my spirits. I love you very tenderly. Remember me with affection, should you never hear from me again. Your affectionate brother, Robert Walton. Very dramatic there, very gothic. We may never see each other again. Kind of like you'll notice, I'm going to be wearing black on the outside, as black as this book gets on the inside. And uh, yeah, so Robert Walton, fatalistic. Here we go, letter number three. To Mrs. Seville, England, July 7th. Now remember when he wanted to leave, he wanted to leave in June. So here we are. My dear sister, I write a few lines in haste to say that I'm safe. And while advanced on my voyage, this letter will reach England by a merchantman now on its home way, homeward voyage from Archangel, more fortunate than I, who may not see my native land, perhaps, for many years. I am, however, in good spirits. My men are bold and apparently firm of purpose. Nor do the floating sheets of ice that continually pass us, indicating the dangers of the region toward which we are advancing, appear to dismay them. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, and although not so warm as in England, the southern gales which blow us speedily towards those shores which I so ardently desire to attain breathe a degree of renovating warmth which I had not expected. No incidents have hitherto befallen us that would make a figure in a letter. One or two stiff gales and the springing of a leak are accidents which experienced navigators scarcely remember to record and I shall be well content if nothing worse happens to us during our voyage. So yeah, you know, the usual, get a few leaks here and there, a few storms, but all seems to be well. Adieu, my dear Margaret. Be assured that for your own sake, as well as yours, my own sake as well as yours, I will not rashly encounter danger. I will be cool, persevering, and prudent. So right here, that's a description of Walton, a character description. He's cool, persevering, and prudent. Make a note of that. But success shall crown my endeavors. Wherefore not? Thus far I have gone, tracing a secure way over the pathless seas, and the very stars themselves being witnesses and testimonies of my triumph. Why not still proceed over the untamed yet obedient element? What can stop the determined heart and resolved will of man? It's a good question. Huh? My swelling heart involuntarily pours itself out thus. But I must finish. Heaven bless my beloved sister. All right, so here we are with that letter. Um, we are going to go into letter four, which is really extended, and this is where things start to come 
to a head. So uh, the story itself now takes off. It's just background story so far. Letter four is where the story actually starts, the story within the story. To Mrs. Seville, England, August 5th. So almost a month later. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it. Although it is very probable that you will see me before the papers can come into your possession. Because he's on this trip now and he's out in the middle of nowhere, uh, he will probably return before the letter gets there, is what he's saying. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice, which closed in on the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving her the sea room in which she floated. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were compressed round by very thick fog. We accordingly lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. Remember, he thinks that once they get through the ice and snow, it's going to open up and be this wonderful uh, sight of just eternal daylight and sunshine and, and warmer weather. About two o'clock, the mist cleared away, and we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful and anxious thoughts, when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention and diverted our solicitude from our own situation. We perceived a low carriage fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs pass on toward the north. At the distance of half a mile, a being which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge and guided the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveler with our telescopes until he was lost among the distant inequalities of the ice. The, this appearance excited our unqualified wonder. We were, as we believed, many hundred miles from land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not in reality so distant as we had supposed. Shut in, however, by ice, it was impossible to follow his track, which we had observed with the greatest attention. About two hours after this occurrence, we heard the ground sea, and before night the ice broke and freed our ship. We, however, lay to until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. I profited of this time to rest for a few hours. Now think about it. He's on his way. He wants to be the first person to get there, and it looks like somebody's going to beat him there. The sled with this gigantic person on it, heading north. It's like, how could it be? So in the back of his mind, you know he's wondering. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went up on deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge, like that we had seen before, which had drifted toward us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, but there was a human being within it, whom the sailors were persuading to enter the vessel. He was not, as the other travelers seemed to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered island, but a European. When I appeared on deck, the master said, Here is our captain, and he will not allow you to perish on the open sea. On perceiving me, the stranger addressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. Before I come on board your vessel, he said, will you have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound? You may uh, conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he would not have exchanged for the most precious wealth uh, the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery towards the northern pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. Good God, Margaret, if you'd seen the man who thus capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen and his body dreadfully emaciated by fatigue and suffering. Super skinny emaciated. I never saw a man in so wretched a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air, he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. As soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees, he recovered and ate a little soup, which restored him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and I often feared that his sufferings had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him to my own cabin and attended on him as much as my duty would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness, 
But there are moments when if anyone performs an act of kindness towards him or does him the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were, with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. But he is generally melancholy and despairing, and sometimes he gnashes his teeth, as if impatient of the weight of woes that oppresses him. When my guest was a little recovered, I had the great trouble to keep off the men, who wished to ask him a thousand questions, but I would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity, in a state of body and mind whose restoration evidently depended upon entire repose. Once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom, and he replied, To seek one who fled from me. And did the man whom you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him. For the day before we picked you up, we saw some dogs drawing a sledge and a man on it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the demon, as he called him, had pursued. Soon after, when he was alone with me, he said, I have dealt with excited your curiosity, as well as that of these good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly, it would be very imp impertinent and inhumane in me to trouble you with my inquisitiveness of mind. And yet you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently restored me to life. Soon after this, he inquired if I thought about that the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge. I replied that I could not answer 